Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello, hello, good afternoon. You're all so excited because we're nearing the home stretch. Um, my name is Bob Clark, I'm the Deputy Director here at the Roosevelt Library, and uh, welcome to the penultimate session of the 11th Annual Roosevelt Reading Festival. For those of you who have not uh, been in this room before, let me go over a few rules. Um, the first is, would everyone please take out their electronic devices and turn them off so that our presentation isn't interrupted today. The next is, if you haven't had a chance to see our new permanent exhibits that opened just last year, come and find one of the library staff members and we'll be happy to give you a button that will get you into the exhibits before the end of the day. The exhibits close at six o'clock, so you have plenty of time uh, to see them after the, uh, after the last presentation. Um, and finally, um, our friends at C from C-SPAN are here filming, as they often do, and we appreciate them uh, being here and showing their support for our programs. And because C-SPAN is filming this session, um, at the question and answer period at the end of the session, um, we would ask that you please come to the microphone that will be up here next to me and ask your question from the mic so they can be sure and capture the sound. Um, so let me uh, kind of go over the order of the day. Um, our speaker will speak for about 30 minutes, after which there will be about 10 minutes of, of questions and answers, and then I will whisk him out to the New Deal store where he will be happy to sign all of the books that you're going to want to rush and buy um, after you hear his presentation. Um, so Michael Golay is the author of a number of books on American history, including A Ruined Land, The End of the Civil War, which was a finalist for the Lincoln Prize, and The Tide of Empire, America's March to the Pacific. He is co-author of A Critical Companion to William Faulkner. He's a former, former newspaper journalist and has taught history at Phillips Exeter Academy since 2000. He lives in Exeter, New Hampshire, and Old Lyme, Connecticut, and he is the author of the book you're here to hear about, America 1933, The Great Depression, Lorena Hickok, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the Shaping of the New World. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Golay. Thank you, uh, and thanks for turning out. And I also want to thank this presidential library, which no one interested in the Roosevelts and their era could survive without. It's a fantastic resource for historians. Um, as you've heard, I teach history at Phillips Exeter Academy. You, you should know that uh, teachers at Exeter do not lecture. Um, we have small classes around an oval table, and it's a discussion-based system. I am not, therefore, a skilled lecturer, so this will be a bit of an experiment, much like the early days of Roosevelt's New Deal. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, um, I was in New York City with the History Department, actually, and we toured the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. Um, if you ever have a chance, if you haven't been there, if you have a chance, do uh, tour it. Um, our tour was called Hard Times, and it featured an Italian immigrant family from the 1920s and 1930s. Um, they lived in a three-room apartment. I think the rooms were probably eight feet by eight, very dark, even at midday, uh, airless, pretty cheerless. The building was uh, built in, in, I think, 1863. Um, he was a cabinet maker. Uh, did fairly well until 1929, uh, and jobs became fewer and farther between after that. Um, the guide didn't have a lot of detail about how the family got by during these years, but I would suspect that in the early days they had some assistance from their parish church, uh, maybe from other private charities. Uh, I know that they did get some food allowances from the city of New York because in the apartment were uh, boxes of, that had uh, contained cream cheese. Um, I also noticed that there was a radio in the apartment. Uh, and that must have been a later addition because in 1932 and 1933, the period that this book covers, um, if this family had applied for relief, uh, an investigator would have come to test them for means, and um, that investigator would have seen the radio, regarded it as a convertible asset, and had them sell it uh, before they could be eligible for, for city aid. Um, in 1931, uh, then-President Hoover 
asserted that government aid to the unemployed would sap Americans' initiative, would turn them dependent on government. Um, his view was that the jobless could look out for themselves with a little bit of help from their neighbors, perhaps, and from private charities. Um, Hoover went on to insist that these charities, among them the, the American Red Cross, were adequately e equipped to see the crisis out, which he regarded as temporary. But most private agencies were tapped out by the second and third year of the Great Depression. In fact, by 1932, fully a third of private charities had shut down entirely. There was nothing to distribute. Um, the commonplace phrase, hard times, is a vast understatement. In March of 1933, when Roosevelt took office, 25% of the U.S. working population, about 13 million people, was unemployed. For one example, U.S. Steel Mill in Homestead, Pennsylvania, which had employed 5,200 men in 1929, employed 424 men full-time in 1932. Uh, the need overwhelmed the private agencies. And the cities and the towns were not set up either to meet it. There was no safety net to speak of in, in 1932, 1933. The churches, too, had little left to give. In the coal hamlet of Scottsdale, Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania um, town, the parish pre b priest begged a touring government investigator for aspirin for his parishioners. He'd exhausted his credit at the drugstore. In New York City, one and a quarter million people were wholly dependent on relief in October 1933, and another one million needed help more or less desperately and weren't getting it yet. Many of these were from the stratum that Jacob Rees in the 1880s called the other half, among them the Italian cabinet maker that I mentioned at the start, uh, the one who's been memorialized at the, at the tenement museum. No one would be surprised to hear that the marginal people suffered. Uh, but one of the elements that made the Great Depression great was how deeply its effects were felt in the broad middle class. Long-term joblessness led to malnutrition, health problems, uh, psychological despair, and sooner or later, for many, it led to homelessness. And, and these ills, all of them, affected the middle class also. Um, New York City, in this era, operated a series of municipal shelters uh, supplements to the Hooverville encampments. There was one in Central Park. There's also, incidentally, a very good picture of a Hooverville in the, ex in the museum that has been refurbished and has just reopened. Uh, if you get a chance to uh, get over there, look out for it. Uh, the shelters were places not only for the marginal. Um, the writer Matthew Josephson described the city shelters in the New Republic, and I'm going to read a short passage that, that includes his description. He found the East 25th Street Municipal Shelter and the South Ferry Annex filled to capacity. The shelters served two meals a day, watery oatmeal and thin black coffee for breakfast, 20 ounces of coarse reddish brown vegetable stew, sometimes, though not often, with a gobbet of beef in the broth, three pieces of stale bread, and black coffee for supper. The place was warm enough, almost too warm, he wrote, and filled with a nightly human stench. The men slept in shelter-issued rough cotton nightshirts on army cots, packed like immigrants in the steerage compartments of old passenger steamers. Truly, Josephson noted sardonically, a man no longer need feel himself alone or forgotten. The ailing and the tubercular coughed all night, others snored like hogs. After a six o'clock breakfast, the warders turned the men out into the streets. Some pass the hours in the comfort of the public library and its branches. The libraries are a godsend, one man said. Others shuffled from park to square to park, and still others enlisted in New York City's 6,000 strong army of panhandlers. Men foraged for cigar and cigarette ends and read discarded newspapers with close attention. <laughs> 